we did uh, towards the end of last week on induction gives us some ability to understand what we mean by these um, so-called lumped circuit elements. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's almost a side issue in the sense to our course, which is mainly about the fundamentals of electromagnetism. But, uh, of course, it's also useful to be able to understand how to do things with electromagnetism, and in particular, uh, how to make circuits. Now, obviously, you know, you can't solve the Maxwell equations inside a radio or a television or a computer. So what you have to do is reduce all the complicated effects to some very simple elements, which are input and output devices. And uh, basically, Z, the impedance of any device, is simply the ratio of the voltage you put across the device to the current that flows through it. So uh, everybody, I'm sure, is familiar with the idea V equals IR. So for a resistor, just a piece of resistance wire, we've got this real quantity, R, that relates the um, voltage to the current, V equals IR is uh, one of the first equations that we learn. And from this course, you know, we've managed to get some understanding of the capacitor. Obviously, again, you'll have done quite a lot on that with uh, Kieran uh, Gibson's course last year. And finally, we uh, looked at the uh, inductor in the, in the last one. In particular, I looked at mutual inductance and self-inductance. If you have a change in current in a coil, it produces a back EMF in another coil that's wound round it, but also in itself. And uh, I'm going to make lecture 24 uh, a very brief one because we, we have got a bit behind in the course and uh, I want to plough on with the uh, more challenging stuff. But uh, uh, just to Again, I'll, I'll run very briefly through. They're very, very simple notes indeed on uh, electromechanical implications of Faraday's law. And in the last lecture, we saw exactly the EMF is minus L di by dt. We get effectively a voltage drop. Now, again, I've stressed this several times. It's not really a voltage. This is due to the Faraday's law effect of a change in current, and so we couldn't possibly describe it by a static potential. What we do, though, is we imagine that we've got all the complicated stuff in a box, and then we take two very long leads away, for example, from Selby Power Station to sockets in here, and we pretend that we can treat it as an effective voltage drop across an element called an inductor. And uh, these ones are so uh, well known to you that uh, I don't think it needs further commentary. So the whole idea of reducing all of the complicated effects of electromagnetism to input output devices enables us to set up this very straightforward differential equation. Of course, di by dt by definition is d by dt of dq by dt. So we get ld 2 q by dt squared plus r dq by dt plus q over c is equal to the driving EMF of the circuit. And this, in fact, reduces the whole of the complexity to simply solving this second-order differential equation. And uh, we had plenty of practice at doing that um, in the maths course last year. So <clears throat> when you adopt this approach, of course, we're usually interested in sinusoidally varying EMFs. Obviously, we have 50 hertz AC mains. So we're usually interested <coughs> in a driving EMF which is uh, sinusoidal. However, uh, I'm going to come back now to this um, thing that we, that we left slightly hanging earlier in the course on this crossbar example uh, of figure 36. So the crossbar example is shown uh, here and uh, we've analysed it already by Faraday's law. We saw that the EMF induced, if I slide this crossbar in a constant magnetic field, is the field strength times the width of the crossbar times the velocity. Now, that is um, from Faraday's law, but we're now going to assume, now I set a problem earlier in the term that we can now revisit, 
now going to look at the two possibilities. First of all, I'm going to say that we assume the current has zero capacitance. We can neglect the electrical charge that builds up on the surface of the wires. In other words, we're now going to treat this as a circuit, but we're going to drop the dq by um, <coughs> the, sorry, the Q over C term, and which so the, the EMF, which we've already proved is BWV, is LDI by DT. This is due to the self inductance, and IR due to the resistance. So we've, um, we've already done the analysis, if you like, of the negligible inductance case. So of course, we can solve this equation in general, but I've broken it down into two parts. So first of all, we're going to say, well, let's assume that this term is basically neg negligible. Then the entire voltage, effective voltage drop, the back EMF, is just given by IR. And then that is a relatively straightforward problem to solve because we know the EMF acts as an effective voltage. This is just Ohm's law that the effective voltage divided by the resistance is the current. Again, we need this result, which we can prove from first principles. But again, most people knew coming into the course that the magnitude of the force is the length of the crossbar times the current times the magnetic field. So this gives us an expression for the force, which is a velocity dependent force. And applying Newton's, again, we're, we're assuming that we're just moving a crossbar at a very ordinary, non-relativistic speed. So we can apply Newton's law directly as mdv by dt. And this gives us that dv by dt is the minus b squared w squared over mr, taking the m across times the velocity. Well, of course, that's a absolutely trivial differential equation to solve. It's a first order separable differential equation and the rod just slows down. The velocity uh, decays exponentially as a function of time and the rate constant for this is precisely b squared w squared over m times r. So we've effectively uh, done that problem before. The new thing that we can now solve, having studied inductance, in a little bit more detail in the last lecture is, well, what happens if we have the opposite case? And I set this as a kind of like test example earlier in the term. What happens if we have the opposite case where um, we have no resistance? So we could imagine the whole circuit's made of a superconductor and we have to consider the inductance. So it's, of course, the same driving EMF. The physics has not been affected at all. We've pushed this crossbar, and there's a back EMF induced in this circuit. And we know that the back EMF will be precisely, it opposes the flux change. So if you like, it will drive current uh, in the opposite sense around the circuit. Well, now we've got that the EMF is the self-inductance times di by dt. And so the simplest way to solve this differential equation, rather than doing it in terms of the velocity, which is what we did with the um, resistance uh, case, is to simply say, well, let's let V be dx by dt. So Bw dx by dt is LDI by dt. And clearly, we can integrate both times with respect to time to get Bwx is Li assuming that we've got the boundary condition of no current uh, when x is equal to zero. So again, of course, this formula hasn't changed. The force on the crossbar is just the same. It's the length of the bar times the current times the magnetic field. But now when we put that into this differential equation, we get that the force is minus, again, we get all the constants in here, square of the magnetic field, square of the length of the crossbar divided now by the inductance of the circuit, but now times x. Well, clearly, when we put in f is equal to m d2x by dt squared, we get d2x by dt squared is a whole bunch of constants times x. So in other words, again, we couldn't have a much easier differential equation to solve that we get simple harmonic motion. And that was, uh, if you like, left as a, a bit of a, 
a tester for you in the earlier part of the term to work out what might happen if there was no resistance in the circuit to dissipate it. And the idea is basically that the force is still there and so you get a retarding force on the crossbar but basically it's just simply a position dependent force. So of course eventually as the crossbar goes back this way it will reach a certain point where again it's now, as the crossbar is moving that way, the self-inductance will oppose the flux change and will drive the crossbar back the other way, and it performs SHM. Of course, if we took both the two terms into account at the same time, the resistance and the inductance, we'd get damped harmonic motion. But uh, that's just, a, if you like, uh, an obvious development of the physics of the case. So... Those are two electromechanical implications of Faraday's law. If we push this crossbar and it's got a lot of resistance, the energy is dissipated and the crossbar slows down. If we've got no resistance, the crossbar will oscillate. There's nowhere for the energy to go. So its self-inductance will cause the, the circuit to perform an oscillatory mechanical motion. Now, I mean, it goes without saying that um, the discovery that... Um, current carrying wires have got mechanical forces on them uh, to completely change world history. Uh, much more so than anything probably, you, you know, any great statesman that you read about in um, history books. This was the beginning of the end of the steam part of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, basically, we use it for all sorts of things. I mean, now, you know, you need to get a tooth drilled. Well, mm, you know... Of course, you plug a dentist plugs a drill into the into the AC mains and it and it rotates much easier than uh, getting dentistry. Did, needless to say, before the drill, you know, a coffee grinder, every, anything you like, you know, you want to grind your coffee, you just put on your coffee grinder, blade rotates, grinds the coffee into a powder. We use it's, it's you know like lots of little machines as well as the great big you know, industrial machines that we might use for lifting things. And uh, earlier on, when we were looking at Faraday's law, I gave some other various examples that I thought now we, we just very briefly revisit. Uh, the idea of electromagnetic brakes. Well, and, and, and so as we swing this pendulum into the, into the field, again, it could be one of these two cases. If it's got a lot of resistance, the thing is just going to slow down. And it's a remarkable effect. It's not touching anything, but it looks like it's sort of gone into a jar of honey. You see the pendulum slow down. But likewise, of course, if it was made of a superconductor, there'd be nowhere for the energy to go, so it would bounce back out again. And all of, a lot of um, modern deep Mercedes have been investigating quite a lot, having um, electromagnetic braking systems. I mean, there's no, there's no friction. The parts don't wear down. It's an electromagnetic field that slows the motion down. So uh, it's an extremely effective um, use, again, of electromechanical implications of Faraday's law. So, uh, well, <clears throat> maybe spare the details because uh, we've studied that. And again, just to mention, if you do um, help out on the, uh, the UCAS days, you'd have seen this many times. Today's the last, it just occurred to me, it's the last UCAS day, so they might be doing these experiments if you want to have a look at them. And again, the Thompson's jumping ring experiment. Again, you cool the stuff down to liquid nitrogen temperature precisely to reduce the resistance of the material. And when you've got an AC generator, when the top half of this becomes a north pole, the bottom bit of the conducting ring becomes a north pole and the top becomes a south pole, you've got the thing down at liquid nitrogen temperature, there's not much energy to dissipate it. And if you like now, you've got in effect an electromagnetic gun. You know, this ring shoots off at quite a, a high speed. So there's enormous quantities of effects. The last one that I'll come to is uh, the Meissner effect. 
And again, you can see that as an electromechanical consequence of Faraday's law, that as you try and move the magnet down towards the superconductor, you get eddy currents start to flow, they make this a north pole, they make this a south pole, and so the magnet is repulsed by, it's almost like an image of the magnet itself in the superconductor. Because these currents now will flow with no resistance, um, the, pot, the magnet just hovers in this magnetic field that it's made, if you like, for itself in the image in the superconductor. So electromechanical implications of Faraday's law are enormous, but in a sense we've covered most of them. So what I want to do today, the reason I'm sort of powering on a bit is we got a bit behind with the course. I'd like to get straight on to back to the more, um, if you like, fundamental side of things and um, to look into uh, field energy and pointings vector. So the <coughs> at the moment, and again, I can't stress how important in, you know this, this is is that we've gone over to a completely new way of looking at energy in the electromagnetic field. It's not like, <coughs> you know, that we had that very basic formula that if you have Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught R12 for two charges, these point charges, you've got no idea where that energy is located. Likewise, if you use the formula U for a continuous charge di distribution is a half rho phi dV, you can do the integral and get the total energy of continuous charges, but it is not telling you anything about the location of the energy. Whereas this is a totally new way of looking at things where this lowercase u here is an energy density in joules per cubic metre at every point in space. And so you can find the energy at every point in space. And the field itself, this is an important point that we'll develop on Wednesday, is physically real. It's got energy, it has got momentum, it has got angular momentum. So it's, uh, we've got to start thinking in a sense of the field itself as a physically real quantity. It's not just a way of convenient way of calculating, it is physically real. And indeed, uh, talking of electromechanical implications of Faraday's law, in that example where we had the paradox in figure 37, the disk does rotate precisely because the electromagnetic field passes energy to the mechanical system. We'll come back to that on Wednesday. So in this new schema we have an energy density and of course we obtain the total energy, capital U, by integrating E squared or E dot E over all space. And likewise, again, I didn't um, prove this formula, uh, but the ha we have an equivalent ex um, expression for the energy density of the magnetic field, which we can write as either a half epsilon naught c squared b squared. I think that's possibly the easier one to remember. But of course, after our unification theory, we can also write the constant as 1 over 2 mu naught. So this is the scenario that we're going to develop today is um, this whole idea of field energy and uh, pointings vector. So I say the, um, the lecture 24 I've so just covered very very briefly, it's quite a, a simple one, I'm going to go straight on with the lecture 25 field energy and pointings vector. If you like, lecture 24 was just to kind of link up the fundamentals of electromagnetism with um, what we do in simple circuits. So, what I am um, <coughs> going to develop is, 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 is uh, again, I've shown those formulae and they are in general true. 
So this is always the energy density of an electric field, irrespective of what's producing it. So it's true in electrodynamics. This is always the energy of a magnetic field. This is true in electrodynamics. So of course, there is only electricity and magnetism. We get the following expression for the energy density of the electromagnetic field. So this is the true general expression in any circumstances for the energy density of the electromagnetic field. And we've just got to sum up the energy densities of the... Oops. Oh, get it right eventually. We've got, and again, this is now the lowercase u. Yeah, this is a formula for the energy density. Well, it's equal to the energy density of the electric field plus the energy density, which I'm going to write in this form. Particularly, uh, we're going on now to the energy carried by electromagnetic waves in this lecture, and it's more convenient to write this constant as epsilon naught c squared b dot b. And again, of course, you, you can write this as e squared and you can write this as b squared. It's usually written as the scalar product of the field um, with itself. The next step is one that we took with charge conservation and that is we're going to stress the importance of local energy conservation. So again we had these uh, and I gave these examples that if you've got charge conservation you can say perfectly well well I've got a charge Q1 over here and a charge Q2 over here it conserves the charge of the universe if that suddenly disappears and turns up over here. However it's a very much stronger principle to have local conservation. In other words, if, in order for charge to get from here to here, it's got to flow all through the intervening space. And I hope you'll remember that we were able to derive an equation. This is, just, this is not about the energy at the moment, but it's going to be an analogy that the divergence of the current density and at any point in space we can take an infinitesimal area and work out how many coulombs per square meter per second are going through as described by this current density vector was minus d rho by dt. So that was local charge conservation and the next thing I'm going to do is local energy conservation. So in other words if we've got a particular energy density, then for energy to get from there to somewhere else, this is its local density in joules per cubic metre, there's got to be a flow vector in the electromagnetic field. And that is what we're going to derive. So local energy conservation requires that the total field energy in a given volume, so we've got, we assume that we've got an electromagnetic field and that gives us a local energy density, <coughs> well, well let, let's just say local energy in a given volume decreases and now I'll explain this either or in a minute, either because field energy flows out of the volume so this is just like the case we discussed with charge but there's an extra complication, you know, we're delighted to hear because energy, of course, can change form or because the field loses energy to matter.
and uh, I'll just put this up out of the way, a bit higher. I'll give the full equation first and then we'll discuss it next. So minus d by dt of the volume integral of u dv. So this term here is the negative rate of change of energy. This is the lowercase u integrated over the volume. So this is the rate of loss of energy and this is equal to the normal component of the surface integral of a vector called S. This is the, what's called the pointing vector plus and now this term is the work done on matter. We'll come back again to this in a bit more detail in a minute. Let's get the actual equation up here. The board's right in a minute. Let's move that up. Oh, can't tell up from down today. Getting there eventually. Uh, where S, this is the vector we're going to concentrate on here, represents the energy flow of the field. chalk here. I.e. the flow of energy per unit time per unit area perpendicular to the flow. So it has the units of joules per square metre per second and S after its discoverer is called Poynting's vector pointing with a Y. OK, so there's the maths. What does it all mean? When we um, did the charge conservation, we were thinking First, as I say, we, we, we had these very, very different sort of ideologies that charge can't jump from one place to another, it has to flow. And that was something we used, um, indeed, decisively to derive the Ampere-Maxwell law, this idea of the charge conservation. So, to bring you back to figure 45, the way that we handled it was to say, well, the integral of j dot n, where j is the current density vector. So again, I'm going to be making this analogy so that we can cut the math short quite a bit. You see, this j, which is a vector, is in coulombs per square metre per second. And we had some kind of total charge, q, inside this closed surface S. So if we took the surface integral of J dot N over a surface, and now I have throughout this done a surface integral as a capital S here. Now unfortunately Poynting's vector is written with a capital S, so in this lecture I'm going to and the next lecture, make this explicitly an area integral, because I don't like the idea of having a capital S for Poynting's vector and a capital S for the surface integral. But that's um, a trivial point, in a sense. But the idea was, well, the negative rate of change of the, of the charge inside had got to be equal to the surface integral of this vector. 
Now, if instead of the charge inside, I have the total energy inside, then you think, well, all I'll have to do is replace this vector with this one, which is in joules per square meter per second. And obviously, this total energy here is in joules, just like this total charge here was in coulombs. So it's the same idea. However, you'll notice there's another term here. Now, charge is absolutely conserved. So, in other words, for charge to get from one place to another, it has to flow out of the volume. Full stop, end of story, only one equation. We just have to replace this with a charge density, a rho, and we replace this with a current density, a j, and there's no other term. But energy can be converted into other forms. For example, it might be converted into making a little piece of tungsten go very hot and glow. And so there, the field is doing work on matter. The electromagnetic energy is being converted into, in this thing, light and heat. So that we have a second term. That's why the local energy conservation is a little bit more difficult than the local charge conservation because we've got a second term. Now, I'll justify why this term is the, the, the volume integral of the scalar product of the electric field and the current density vector in the lecture on Wednesday. In today's lecture, I want to concentrate on this term here and uh, we shall work with that one a lot more uh, on Wednesday. So again, but given that sort of overall approach, I'm going to do pretty much what I did for charge conservation. Again, note that I've changed area integral to surface integral when I replace the current density with the pointing vector. But everything else is pretty much the same. And again, of course, I have to replace my charge inside with my total energy inside the volume. So the way that we handled the charge conservation was we say, well, but Q inside is the integral of rho dV, which now becomes the integral of lowercase u dV. So this, the surface integral of the pointing vector is just minus d by dt of the volume integral of the energy density. And again, Gauss's theorem is a theorem in pure mathematics. Of course, it applies to the pointing vector just as much as it applies to the current density vector. It's just an example of a vector field. So again, and we've used this trick so much throughout the course, we've got here a surface integral. We convert it by Gauss's theorem to a volume integral over the divergence, but because this is equal to a volume integral over the charge density, we were able to extract this differential local charge conservation. And of course, just you can see, well, all we have to do, go round, is replace the symbols. We're bound to get that the divergence of Poynting's vector is the minus du by dt, where u is the uh, volume, <coughs> excuse me, the, the energy uh, per unit volume. So if you've got that idea clear, uh, the, the next um, development is quite straightforward. So let's follow that, so I'll use these boards. So um, we can, using Gauss's theorem, and Gauss's theorem, of course, applies to any field. So we can use Gauss's theorem to convert the surface integral in equation 25-2. So that's the, the main equation of this lecture. In equation 25-2, to a volume integral over the divergence of S. So we get minus 
D, well, let's write the, uh, we, again, we've used this many times. We can write this, the time derivative inside or outside the, um, the volume integral. Again, said this many times. We're assuming that integration with respect to space commutes with differentiation with respect to time. So I can take the, uh, the time derivative inside the integral. Using Gauss's theorem, I convert this surface integral. So I've changed the uh, S to an A to emphasize it's the area integral. This just becomes the volume integral of the divergence of S dV and plus now the volume integral of E dot J dV. So this represents the total rate of loss of energy within the volume V. This represents the energy that has simply flowed out of the volume V. And this represents any work done by the electromagnetic field on matter inside the volume V. So these are the three terms. And again, we've used this before. This equation is true for any arbitrary volume in space. So the integrands must be equal. So since this equation is true for any volume in space, the integrands must be equal. In other words, minus du by dt is equal to del dot s plus e dot j. Make this equation 25.3. So this is now, equation 25.3, this is incredibly similar to the differential equation for charge conservation, which is on the upper board, that del dot j is minus d rho by dt. But uh, we've got this extra term here because we've got the possibility. It's not like with charge. Here, the field can lose energy to matter inside the volume. It doesn't all have to flow out in order for the energy density to decrease. So pointing, and this was in, if you're interested in the history side, it was in 1884, uh, used equation 25.3 and the Maxwell equations to show that S is equal to epsilon naught C squared E cross B. And again, there is quite a lot of maths involved in getting from equation 25.3 and the Maxwell equations to Poynting's vector. So even Feynman fights a bit shy of the derivation, but it is in the Feynman lectures 27.3 for the kind of argument used. And see also, there's a book by Panofsky and Phillips on electromagnetism for the details. So, Again, I think it would take us a little bit too far from the flow of the, our lecture course to go through the maths here. I hope you can follow that this argument, this is, this is probably the most advanced lecture of the course, but uh, you can follow the argument which gave us this differential equation from this integral conservation of energy, conservation of local energy, 
And <clears throat> the fact that, well, you know, the Maxwell equations were developed in 1861, that it took the best part of a quarter of a century before a, a very brilliant American scientist recognised that this was the equation uh, for the energy flow vector. And uh, this is the, the correct expression for that energy flow. Now, there's a lot to take in there, so I've just put it, if you like, on a summary. This is the energy density in the electromagnetic field. So I have, th th this is from an older one. This is the uh, charge, uh, the energy conservation equation, and we replace this surface integral with this volume integral. Then we've got three volume integrals, so the integrands have got to be equal to each other, and you've got now, as a necessary consequence of this equation and the Maxwell equations, gives you this flow vector in the electromagnetic field. And as I say, the, um, it's not one of the books I've recommended in general, but I think the clearest derivation of this equation, uh, 25.4, is in the Panofsky and Phillips. So we're going to look at all the consequences of this, mainly on uh, Wednesday, but just to give you a kind of heads up that it obviously works with what we said previously about electromagnetic waves. That uh, there's Poynting's vector, there is the electric field vector, there is the magnetic field vector. And it's, it's obvious from the form of Poynting's vector that these three are going to be mutually at right angles to each other. We've got the cross product of the electric and the magnetic fields. And if you like now, we kind of work backwards. We actually work from the idea of propagation of the wave going down, say, down the lecture theatre and the electric vector oscillating one way and the magnetic the other. This is now saying, well, if I've got an electric field and a magnetic field at right angles, then the flow of energy in the electromagnetic field is at right angles to both this vector and this vector. And of course, this is precisely the direction of the wave propagation. So you might think, well, this is a bit of a kind of ludicrous backhanded method, but the pointing vector theory will enable us to calculate energy flow in any circumstance, not just in an electromagnetic field, and it will also, of course, <coughs> enable us, because now we've got the correct constant in front, because we know that the true constant in terms of the electric and magnetic fields, to replace all of those equations where we looked at the amplitude of fields uh, as some um, kind of arbitrary contribution to the irradiance, we'll be able to work out uh, the exact energy in all circumstances. However, this is the time you've all been waiting for. It's time for the module evaluation forms. Because we've reached the last week of term and uh, I should give these out. And we've got 10 minutes, so again, I'll 